Thank you for joining us here online at Hope Church Boulder City, Nevada. We are honored that you are here and we believe that God is going to use this service to bless you and many others around the world. Here at Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live a life of a Jesus follower. We believe that a Jesus follower abides in Christ, connects in community, and shares in the mission. There are so many amazing things happening in our church that we'd like for you to be a part of. If you'd like to find out more, please visit us at hopechurchbc.com or you can find us on Facebook at HC Boulder City. On behalf of Hope, we thank you once again for worshiping with us and we pray that you enjoy the service. Good morning. Woo. Hello, Hope Church, Boulder City. Look at all these beautiful faces. All right. Look at all those busy people in the back getting our lunch ready. I made a tortellini. It's in the green crock pot. It's really good. Just saying. All right. Well, we're going to welcome you. If you haven't been here before, we're so happy that you're here. And I, um, have forgotten to say this like the last few weeks. So there's a, there con there's a connection card in the seat in front of you. So if you've never been here before, uh, we'd love to get to know you. So go ahead and put your name and your number if you'd like us to have it. We do a lot of uh, messages during the week, not a lot. I shouldn't say that. We do like a message or two during the week if things are happening. We're not going to blow up your phone. Um, and your email just so that we have a way of getting in, in contact with you. Um, so if you wouldn't mind filling that out, there's a, a receptacle in the back that you can put that in. But we're so happy you're here. There's also, if you're, this is your first time, there's a fun goodie bag in the lobby. Go ahead and pick one up. There's also a couple of coffee mugs. They come in two colors. And I realized this morning when I put on my shirt that I was wearing this. <laughs> How funny is that? All right, so it comes in two different colors. Pick one, pick two, pick four. No one's counting. Uh, well, let's welcome each other, um, shake a hand, hug a neck. I said, um, it sounded like Annette last week when I said it. And someone's like, who's Annette? Why do we need a hugger? <laughs> so no, just hug a neck, shake a hand, welcome each other, and we'll get to, uh, we'll get to worshiping.
Okay, okay. I forgot to mention one thing. We, kids, we are doing Lion today. So after we sing our first two songs, Mr. Jeff is going to go out into the lobby and all the kids um, during the prayer are going to go um, out there and line up for, for Lion, okay? Okay, we'll remind you though. Hey Amen. Well, good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. Let's stand to our feet. Hey Amen. If you have any questions about our post-it notes up front on the stage, just give, want to give you some context about that. For our worship night, the question was asked, what are you saying yes to? So all of our kids brought their post-it notes up to the front on what they're saying yes to. So that's why you may see those on the stage. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord, he is good to me. You've turned my morning into dancing, put off my rags, clothed me with gladness, and I will arise, I will praise you, I'll sing and not be silent. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord, He is good to me. You've turned my morning into dancing, put off my rags, clothe me with gladness, and I will arise. I will praise you, I'll sing and not be
You know, as a as a kid, we learn these. Um, we learn about the fruit of the spirit. I mean, as adults too. But it's something like so simple. We hear about it all the time. Oh, the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit. You know, and you you have pictures in your house of like literal fruit, and it, you think of it as such a simple thing. And the truth is that as Christians, as believers in Christ, when you accept. The, the fate and the love and all the things that God has for you, the salvation. When the Spirit inhabits you, those fruits are literal fruit in your life, right? And that is what is so powerful about this song. I love that we talk about the spirit of the living God. It's not just something that you do in a moment. It's living inside of you. It's living in your choices. It's living in your decisions and in how you love people and how you react to people. And that is why I'm so grateful, not only that you know Jesus came to save us, but that we have the spirit to change us. Amen? Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice, we're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. Every word in the Bible that is true, every word that you speak over our lives, God, we're hanging on those words. Sing that again. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word. When you speak, when you move, when you do what only you can do, it changes us, it changes what we see and what we see. Because when you come,
If you guys want to go ahead and head out that way, that would be fine now, okay? Psalm 136, 1 through 3 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. The God of gods. The God of all, all the gods, all the idols, all of the things. Give thanks to the God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. Oh, his faithful love endures forever. Even when we don't feel it and we don't see it and we don't think about it and we can't, we can't comprehend it, his faithful love endures forever. Not like the faithful that we know. Not like the faithful that we see in ourselves, but the faithful love that only God can have. Endures forever in Jesus' name. Revelations 5 and 12, it says, and they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they sang blessing and honor Glory and power belong to the one who is sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And man, if we believe that today, I'm so thankful this morning that Jesus is the Lion and the Lamb. He's Alpha and Omega. He's beginning and the end. He is our Messiah. This song, it goes like this and it says, 
Amen. Let's give him praise, church, for the line of Judah.
Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. All the glory you're deserving of. All the glory, all the glory, all the glory. Come on, church, let's give him the highest praise. Hallelujah. we are so thankful that you have sent your son. God, the one who submitted to your will. And he preciously died. God, this morning we are thankful for everything that you have provided for us. provided back then on the cross, God, and you are providing for us now. And God, anything that we don't have, God, we know if you did it before, you will do it again. You are the same God right now as you were the same God back then. So God, this morning we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love and kindness, God. We thank you for our families. God, that we get time to commune with them. God, thank you for that blessing. God, and in this moment and through the next of this week and into the new year, God, will we find ourselves giving you the glory. Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. Good to see all of y'all this morning. Good worship time. Again, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting all of you, but my name is Chip pastor, uh, one of the pastors at Hope Church, and it's my pleasure just to be here this morning, just to say a few words. Um, I just want to say to all of you, boy, it has been a journey over the past year. It's been a journey of prayer. It's been a journey of many, many interviews uh, just to um, pray over God's selection for who is to be the new pastor at Hope Church, Boulder City, it's been a journey because it's important, because you're important. This church, this fellowship is important. You're a, you're, I don't want, I want to say this the right way. You're a special group of Jesus followers. <laughs> Please take that the right way. <laughs> this is a special place. It's a special church. The Lord's hand is over this church and God's spirit is here. And so we wanted to very carefully pursue God's choice for campus pastor here. And he's, he did that through all the prayer and through all of the, the discussions and the interviews. God has selected his person for this time. And we're so, so excited about that. And so today, I know you've already met him. But I want to introduce for the first time the new campus pastor at Hope Church Boulder City, Eric Shellner. And his family, y'all come on up. <laughs> we are so excited for this family. Eric, Pastor Eric. And you guys have 
have met. They just rolled into town last week, but this is Jess. Yeah, you guys have met Jess. And Titus, right? You know, I haven't met you guys yet. So this is Titus, right? Hey, Titus, good to see you, man. And then this is Aurora. Nice to see you. And then Ty, I mean, Maddox, Maddox, right? Maddox, good to see you, buddy. Yes, good to see you guys. We're so excited for you guys to be here. Um, I know that this is the start of many, many years of, of serving together and expanding God's kingdom together. And you guys know that um, during the interview process, you know, we, we obviously are interviewing the candidate for pastor at Boulder City. But I'll tell you, they say beside every godly man is a surprised wife, right? <laughs> so that's what they say. <laughs> No, seriously, Jess, uh, it, was, it was so good to get to know you through this process and see your heart for ministry and how God is going to use you as a family here in Boulder City as we literally, God uses this as a, as a place to expand God's kingdom in Boulder City and throughout all of the world. And so we're excited. And I, I can't tell you how excited I am. And uh, this has been a, a, a culmination of a lot of prayer for you guys. So we're so, so happy that you're here. Um, I know that this church, uh, I'll speak on behalf of our church just to say if there's anything we can do for you over the, when you're settling in and everything, please, please just let us know. Okay, we love you guys. But let me say this. You know, um, there's, when you're looking for a, a, a pastor, there's a lot of characteristics that you'd think you would look for, right? Preaching ability, right? Uh, ministry experience correct, right? Relational quality, being able to work with people and lead people and guide them. Shepherding is so important. Vision, understanding the vision of, of God's church is so important. But those are all good and those are all important. But there was one characteristic that I felt and we felt like it was so important uh, to find in the life of God's person to lead this church. And that is this, is humility. It's humility. And all through this process, from the very beginning, in talking with Pastor Eric, I'll tell you, it was evident to me and to so many others that, that God's humility resides in his heart. That this isn't, this isn't a man that said, boy, I can come here and, you know, blow the doors open and we can do this and that. He was actually coming saying, if God would allow me to, I want to very carefully be obedient to his calling here. And that's, that's a true mark because the mark, think about this, the mark, the, the key mark in the life of Jesus on earth was humility. Even though he was God, he is God, the key mark that he displayed over and over again was humility. He humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. And so, um, I, I just want to say, man, I commend you. For, I mean, it's not like I can commend you for being humble, right? I mean, God <laughs> does that in the life. And we, we sang about the spirit and, and the fruit of the spirit. But I just want to say, man, I, that's, that to me with Eric Shelner has been the key, the key characteristic that I've seen in you so far. So I just, I'm, I'm excited about that because with that attitude, God can do anything, you know? I want to read this verse to you guys because I think it's, it's really important as we look at um, the new pastor, the new campus pastor coming on board, and that's this. In 1 Peter 5, in verse 2, it says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for, the, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock, humility. And then this is for all of us, the flock. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I just want to say this. What it's going to take now as we take steps forward with our new campus pastor and his family here, is this going to take God's grace in our lives as we learn to work together and, and be a family together? Uh, we already are, but, you know, under new leadership. And it's going to take unity of the body so that, and it takes humility 
from God. And we see here it says God, the, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so I just want to say before Pastor Eric preaches his very first sermon here at Hope Boulder City that it's going to take all of us working together in humility and seeing God's grace as we move forward under new leadership here at Hope Church Boulder City. So I'm excited about that. I know you are. Shellner family, we're so glad you guys are here. We love you guys, and um, we're excited for the ministry years ahead of us. So welcome the Shellner family, you guys. Well, uh, I, I can't tell you how much of an honor it is just to be here. I, and it hasn't escaped me that this is a culmination of so many prayers. I know you guys have been praying. We've been praying, uh, but it's, it's also a, just a big, big God who brought us here today, uh, our family. Uh, we're, we're so thankful for the way that you've already provided and cared for us, and uh, uh, we couldn't be happier to be here. And uh, honestly, um, it's kind of difficult to figure out for the very first time what you're going to say, because you don't, you don't get your first sermon very often. So this is like, this might be my last first sermon. And that's, that's odd. It's kind of weird to think about that. Uh, I might never, I, hopefully, I never get another first sermon. I want to be here for years and years and years and years and years and years. And at times, uh, it, it puts pressure on yourself to, you know, be, be, be polished, to be perfect, to be profound in what you say. Uh, but when I think about it, those things, those things are okay. But they make the message focus on the man delivering it and not who the message is supposed to be about. Because it's not about me. It's really not about you either. I don't know if you know that, but <laughs> it's really not. Uh, it's about the God of the universe who loved us so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross for us. It's about our Savior who's worth every bit of adoration and praise, everything that we can absolutely give him. And it's about his mission to call people to himself from every tribe, nation, and tongue. It's all about him. And as I preach my first message here at Hope, I want it to be about the things that God says are most important, not the things that I care about are most important, because that's what our church has to be about. If God said he, or Jesus said he will build his church, but the truth is he won't build anybody else's church. He'll build his church. And so we have to be about the things that God is about. We want to make sure that we get first things first. So for the next two weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at two of the most important elements uh, we see in Scripture as they pertain to the overall health and success of, of really any ministry, but particularly the, the, the success of Hope Church in Boulder City. So I want you to turn your attentions, uh, open your Bibles, or if you have a device, to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul reveals what was of first importance in his life and ministry, and I want to I share with you that today. So uh, and that first importance is understanding the gospel. And so let's hear how he describes it. Now I'd remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And if you've been in church any length of time, you've probably heard this passage, you've probably heard it preached about, you've probably heard it spoken, you've heard it read, you can see it on the screen, it's familiar. And you probably, to hear a preacher say that the gospel is of first importance is like one of the most like, obvious things in the entire world, right? Like, duh, that's, that's why we're all here. But I think if we, if we take a look at many of our churches in our nation, churches around the world, many of our own lives, and many of the lives of, of people who claim to be Christ followers, we might see that a renewed understanding and value on the gospel is more than necessary. Uh, I've been a youth pastor. Uh, I was a youth pastor for 13 years. And one of the first messages I ever got to preach at the last church I was at uh, youth group was about this topic, the gospel. And so we had, we had a, a large church and a, a large youth group, and uh, we had a school, a Christian school that was run by our church. And uh, I wanted to, 
I wanted to show that our, our school and our, our church was preparing kids and equipping kids and students to do the work of the ministry. And so what I did, I thought was a really good idea. It wasn't. <laughs> so during my message, I, I said, hey, I want to show you someone who really knows the gospel. And I went up to one of our young men who was a senior at the time. I won't tell you his name in case you ever meet him. Actually, he's a pastor now, so it's okay. Uh, but I went up to him. I said, hey, um, tell us what the gospel is. So this kid had been in Christian school for 13 years. He had been, his family had been members of the church for forever. Uh, his dad was an elder at our church. And he couldn't do it. And so I, I thought was this great idea. I put him on the spot, which I shouldn't have done. But he this kid, this, this person who had, he claimed to be a believer, uh, had been in Christian school, had been in church his whole life, could not tell you what the gospel was. And so when we say that we want to make the gospel of first importance, do we know it? I won't make the same mistake of coming up to you today and asking you <laughs> what the gospel is, but, but could you do it? Could you give someone the reason for the hope that's in you? Could you declare with, with truth, with clarity, what Jesus did, what he came to do? If the mission of the church is to go and make disciples, which we believe it is, we as the church have to know the gospel. Amen. We have to understand the gospel and be able to declare the gospel. And if we're honest, and if I'm honest about my own life, I too often neglect the gospel. We do this in, in two ways. We, we assume the gospel, which means that we think everyone already knows it. Everyone's already heard it. So we assume that we don't need to share it. We don't need to, uh, we don't need to say it out loud. We don't need to teach it. Or at very least, we, we don't need to proclaim it as central. So we assume everyone knows it. The other way we do it is we minimize the gospel, meaning we believe that we're saved according to the gospel, then, but then after that, we're pretty much on our own to manage life. We may not say this out loud, but we, the practice of our lives reflects it. I mean, how, how often in our lives we, we, we go all week and we get to church and it's time to go to church and we look for our Bible in the morning? I know we have our phone on our phones now, but you, and you haven't picked it up even all week. And so we neglect the gospel or we minimize the gospel. And with both of these, if we do that, Christianity becomes about being good and avoiding what is bad especially feeling good about yourself and avoiding guilt. But that's not what Christianity is. That's not what Jesus has called us to. We neglect the gospel. We teach conformed behavior instead of a heart changed and molded by God's spirit. And Paul dealt with the same problem in the, the church of Galatia. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you and the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there, there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now we say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. See, they were believing that they were saved by grace through the gospel. But then after that, they had to earn their salvation on their own through good works. That's idolatry. And if, in the same way, if we, if we think we're saved through the gospel and yet try to live our lives under our own power, we're neglecting the gospel. The gospel is power for right now, not just for back at conversion. Think about all that, all your church attendance, all your religious activities. I know... Uh, we don't have Sunday school here, but I grew up in the, the age of Sunday school. Remember, we had a star chart every time you attended. Did you guys have that? No? Okay, yeah. gotcha. <laughs> Two people, good. All right, but all your, all your church attendance, all your journals, all your having quiet time, all your, your putting in the time, all your prayers, it's all in vain if you don't have Jesus, Amen. if you don't have the gospel. That's why we need a clear full understanding of the gospel. And Matt Chandler kind of coined this, this phrase. It's called the explicit gospel because the word explicit means stated clearly and in detail, leaving no room 
for confusion or for doubt. We have to have a clear gospel. And that's why Paul lays it out for us back in 1 Corinthians 15, where I hope you're at. So let's, let's break this down. Okay, verses 3 through 4 of 1 Corinthians 15 says this. For I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. And so first we see, we see the gospel defined. And the very first thing we see is Jesus Christ. Okay? Any gospel that's missing Jesus is no gospel at all. It's heresy. Because Jesus himself, when he was on earth, said this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. There's no other way. There's, there's not many roads that lead to heaven. There's not, there's not many paths. There's not many bridges to get us over that, that, that boundary between us and God. There's one, and his name is Jesus. And so every gospel, everything that we do has to be centered about, around the person and work of Jesus Christ, who is central. Without Jesus, the entire work we do, everything without him is meaningless says also, Paul goes on and says, Christ died. It isn't enough that Jesus lived the perfect life. He didn't just come here to be a good example for us to follow. He also had to be the perfect sacrifice. His death was the conclusion of the sacrificial system. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Jesus had to die. There had to be a payment for our debt. One of the first verses we learn when we're kids, and our kids are learning upstairs, the wages of sin is what? Death. It's death. He died so that we can live. There had to be a death. There had to be a payment. And then Paul goes on to say he was buried. He had to die, and he had to be buried. Three days in the grave confirmed that he was dead. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie The Princess Bride. Anyone? So, main character dies, but he's not all the way dead. Right? He's mostly dead. That wasn't the case with Jesus. He was, he was dead. Dead and buried in the grave for three days, confirming that he, in fact, gave his life so that we can live. And then he goes on and says, and he was buried that he was raised. But he didn't stay in the grave. Our gospel has to contain the resurrection. We have to tell people that our God is alive. He's risen. He really did die, was buried, and rose again. He was buried. That, and, and Paul goes on and makes a point of showing that people saw him after he rose from the dead. It wasn't just a story. It says, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles. Last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Have you ever, this is one thing that's so profound about scripture, okay? Have you ever tried... Uh, I, have, I have two sisters. Um, I'm the youngest of three. Have you ever tried, like, with your parents, like, something happened, a vase broke or a window or something in the house, and, like, before mom and dad get home, you try to get, try to get your story straight with your siblings? You know what I'm talking about. Do you know how hard it is to get your story straight with three people? It's, like, impossible. And I was always the one, because I'm the youngest, I was the one, with, I was the one that was the, the truther. And I would always ruin it because I, I wanted to tell the truth. But G, Paul's writing here, he said, 500 people at one time all collaborated the story that Jesus is alive. That's what's one of the things that's so amazing about all the scripture, but the, this in, in, in particularly, that, that 40 different human authors, okay, do you guys realize this? 40 different human authors over the course of 1,500 years wrote one story. Do you know how amazing that is? And what it all culminates in is in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus appeared to people. He is alive. He is resurrected. It wasn't enough 
that he just died. Because if, if he's still dead, sin won. Death is not defeated. But the truth is, he's alive. He is resurrected, and our gospel must contain the resurrection. And Paul goes on twice in this section. He says, according to the scriptures, in accordance with the scriptures, a gospel that does not line up with what the Old Testament predicts and the New Testament proclaims is a false gospel. Christ died according to the scripture. He rose according to the scripture, and we must proclaim the gospel according to the scriptures. It all is one story. All the rest of scriptures tell us why we need a savior. You look at the book of Genesis, and it tells us this this sad account of of humanity that we were were given paradise. We were given everything. I'll be, you guys think it's cold here, right? (laughs) Back home right now, there's, in Grand Rapids where I'm from, 20 inches of snow on the ground that all came this week. It's only November 20th. And they have 20 inches of snow. This feels like paradise sometimes, right? <laughs> not, not in like July and August, but for us, it feels like paradise. We, we humans were literally given paradise. Everything they could ever need. Can you imagine walking in Eden? Can you imagine uh, just taking a walk in the morning as you, you make your coffee and there's a lion? And you just go over and say, hey, bud. Go up to the giraffe, and he puts his head down, and you just scratch his chin, and, and you go and walk with your wife, and it, it says that Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. How amazing was that? We were given that. But then we decided for ourselves, Adam and Eve both decided for themselves that they knew better than God, and they rebelled. And ever since then, our entire universe All of humanity, all of creation was cast into sin. And the scriptures tell us that's why we need a savior. And the whole rest of the Old Testament tells us all the attempts of of man on his own to to regain that that presence of God. They wanted to dwell with God because it was put in our hearts that we're supposed to dwell with God. And so we hear about the the, the Tower of Babel and they're trying to build their way to God and they, they failed miserably over and over and over and over again. It tells, the Old Testament tells of God's mercy to his people, allowing sacrifices to cover their sins so they can once again dwell with, with God in their presence. It tells of how over and over again we took advantage of God's grace and worshipped the created instead of the creator. Amen. All of this, all the scriptures, lead us to the gospel, telling us, about the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and his subsequent burial and resurrection. That's the story of the gospel according to the scriptures. We can't neglect the gospel. We need to know it inside and out. If someone comes up to you, and and this does happen, some of you can attest to this, and they, they see that even in the midst of chaos, maybe it's political chaos, maybe it's just your family's going through some rough stuff, maybe it's climate chaos, whatever, and they see that you're different, you're responding different, they're like, why are you so different? Do you have the truth to tell them? Do you know it? We have to know the full gospel. But just as importantly, we should understand what the gospel means for us every single day. This is where we often fall short, because the gospel isn't just for our conversion, it's for every moment of every single day. Every breath between the moment of your conversion or my conversion to the moment we see Jesus face to face, the gospel is power for all of those things. That's why Paul doesn't just stop with defining the gospel. He also shows us the gospel applied. If you take one thing away from today, this is what I want you to hear. We need to be reminded that the gospel has power for our past, our present, and our future, for all of it. When Paul says in Romans 1.16 that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, he isn't just talking about that moment. Rather, the gospel is the power for all of a Christian's life. For all of it, every moment. It changes everything. It should change everything. Do you ever think about the moments in your life that you realize life would never be the same? Think about this. The moment I first tasted bacon...
I don't know if bacon's going to be in heaven. I really hope so. On a more serious note, the moment I first laid eyes on the woman who had become my wife, I was in eighth grade. No, seventh grade. I was in seventh grade when I met Jessica. She doesn't remember this moment. I was not that remarkable, just like today. The moment I saw that same woman walk down the aisle the day of our wedding changed everything. I knew in that moment life would never be the same. The moment I held my firstborn son, Titus, those of you who are parents, you know, you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) But I know this, this changes everything. You know how scary it is to be a parent? Like, I have to teach a kid not to pick up food off the floor and eat it when I want to pick it up and eat it. <laughs> but when you, when you hold that kid for the very first time, you're like, this, this changes everything. And in those, in those moments, we, we think about them. Priorities change. Goals change. Life as we know it changes in those moments. The same is true of the gospel. When we believe it, We place our faith in it. It changes everything. And if it hasn't, there's reason for concern. Because a gospel that doesn't change you certainly can't save you. The gospel has power for our past, our present, and our future. And here's how Paul says it. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And so first we see the gospel for our past. The key word here is received, to associate oneself with. The original moment when you surrendered your will and received Christ as Lord, that moment was accomplished by the gospel. But not only that, it it also transformed all that has happened in your past. All your dirty secrets, all your shame, all the past moments you think define you, are transformed by the gospel. Paul says it this way in Colossians. He says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, by triumphing over them in him. The gospel can and will transform your past. It doesn't matter what's in your background. It doesn't matter the baggage because the gospel gives us new life. It has power for our past, but it also has power for our present. It says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you that you received in which you stand presently. The gospel allows us to stand because when Christ died on the cross, he not only paid the penalty for our sin, but he also beat the power of sin by raising from the dead. We can have victory over sin and stand in the present because of the gospel. We can do good works out of love because of the love Christ showed us through the gospel. We can have all the hopes all the hope in all circumstances because the resurrection secures our future hope. The gospel has power in anxiety. It has power in depression. It has power in dementia and cancer diagnosis. It has power in the death of a loved one. It has power in divorce, in abuse, and in trauma because it's the gospel in which we stand currently. One of my favorite books, which I'll, I'll just prepare you. I'm going to quote to you all the time. It's called The Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. And this is what he says. I think I have that yeah, the quote up there. The gospel is so foolish, according to my natural wisdom, so scandalous, according to my conscience, and so incredible, according to my timid heart. That's a daily battle to believe the full scope of it, as I should. There is simply no other way to compete with the forebodings of my conscience, the condemnings of my heart, and the lies of the world the devil than to overwhelm such things with daily rehearsings of the gospel. The gospel has power for our past. It has power in our present. And finally, it has power for our future. 
he says, and bit by which you are being saved. Progressive. This is called progressive sanctification. It means that God's not done with you. There's a song uh, I love that if I'm not dead, God's not done. The power of the cross doesn't end at the moment of your salvation. Because Jesus' death paid the penalty of sin, defeated the power of sin, and one day will rid our entire world, our entire, all of creation, will rid it of the presence of sin. This means that the gospel has power in our earthly future, while we're still here, while we're still on mission for Jesus Christ. Christ's death enables us to have a relationship with God. He paid the price for our sin so we can continue to grow closer to him. You know, like, I used to think, the first time I ever heard the gospel, I was, I was pretty young, and I, it w- came with the realization that there's a very real place called hell, and I was scared to death, right? And, and today, a, a, lot of, a lot of teachers, a lot of preachers, a, a lot of good-intentioned people will, will just try to scare people into heaven because of the, the, the punishment of hell, which is a very real thing. But the truth is, the greatest reward is, is Jesus. Like if Jesus isn't in heaven, you realize that heaven's nothing without the presence of Jesus. We get his presence. We get his power. We get the person of Jesus himself now on earth. We have hope. We have power in our earthly future. Christ's death enables that relationship. The gospel also has power for our heavenly future. Christ's death made a way for us, us to spend eternity with God. I read this the other night at, the, at the, the worship night on Friday, but I want to read it for you again from Revelation 21. Just picture this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be to them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. This is the end of the gospel's work. It's no wonder that Paul says back in 1 Corinthians, he says, This is of, this is of first importance. And it must be of first importance for us at Hope. It has to be. Because po- there is no power in anything else. So what does this mean for us? To be your pastor is a, is a great honor. I, I prayed for this day uh, so many times. I've, I've waited for this day. I came in early, I don't know why, and just paced around because I was so excited for today just to be with you. But it's also a great responsibility. And I don't take that lightly. It's my duty and my joy to keep the gospel ever before our eyes. To remind you and to remind me of its power for your life and my life right here and right now. Not just in the past, not just in the future, but right now. And it's our collective responsibility to make sure that every event, every program, every service is guided and shaped by the power of the gospel. It's of first importance. Amen. I'm going to work hard to be intentional and purposeful in all that we do to keep the, the gospel central. It means sometimes we're going to have to say no to some good things in order to say yes to the best things, the things that are of most and first importance. And I'll be honest with you, I won't do it perfectly. I'm going to make mistakes. And I'll have to change course sometimes but I will always come right back here, right back to the gospel of first importance. But I have to tell you, I, I can't do this on my own. I can't. I, 
The Holy Spirit is living inside me. I, I believe that. But I, I can't do this physically. I can't do this emotionally. I can't do it spiritually on my own. That's why we have a church body. The role of pastor means to shepherd. It means to lead, to protect, to encourage. But it does not mean that I have to do all the work for you. Just, just telling you. We're going to talk about that more next week. Because Ephesians 4 says that God gave shepherds and elders to the church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. We have to do it together. I believe that the best days are ahead for Hope Church Boulder City. And it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with anything that I bring to the table. I'm just Eric Shelner. My mom can tell you all my secrets. She's right there. She can tell you how embarrassing I was as a little kid. She can tell you how awkward I was, how I couldn't stand in front of people and string two words together. I don't bring anything to the table. Instead, the best days are ahead because we stand unshaken on the gospel and in the power it has for our past, our present, and our future. It is of first importance for Hope Church, Boulder City, and will be as long as I am allowed to lead. And that hope can be yours today. Maybe you, you, as you've heard me talk this morning, you've realized that the gospel hasn't changed you. It hasn't made a difference in my life. And maybe you've realized that, that you've really never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, that you've never accepted or understood the full extent of the gospel. You've never experienced the hope, the power, and the peace that the gospel brings. Here's what I have to say to you. There are a lot of people in churches that think they're saved because they've been in church their whole life. But your church attendance and walking here in here on a Sunday morning is not what saves you. It's Jesus Christ and faith in the gospel. And don't leave here today without finding out how you can experience that power and that peace and that hope. So when everyone else is walking towards the back to eat all the delicious food that people have prepared for us today, if that's you, walk forward. Come put your hand in my hand and let me show you how you can experience and understand the power of the gospel today. Because that's what we stand on. It's of first importance in, in my life it will be in, of first importance in everything we do here at Hope. Let's pray together. Father God, it is good to be with your people today. It is good to, to sing the praises of our Savior. It is good to fellowship together. It is good to be here. But God, don't let us miss what your son is trying to do in and through us and in and through the power of the gospel. Don't let us walk out of here unchanged today or, or, or not thinking differently about who we are and what we're supposed to be doing, God. It's all about you. It's not about good music. It's not about just the right seat. It's not, just, it's not about just the right people around us, just the right congregation, just the right leader. It's, it's all about you, Jesus. And God, as, as we can start this journey together at Hope Boulder City, would you constantly place before us the need to be surrendered to you each and every day, the, the, the need to rem be reminded of the gospel in our lives. And God, as, as your servant said in Hebrews 12, throwing off every weight and sin entangles and setting our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We walk together, Lord. And so today, God, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, has never experienced the power of the gospel, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that they can experience your love, your grace, your goodness, your power, and your peace and your hope. We stand on it, Lord. We stand in your son's name, in which we pray. Amen. Thank you.
I'm so excited. Isn't that so exciting? All right, so typically we have um, Awana and youth on Wednesdays, but this week, since we have Thanksgiving on Thursday, we won't have those things, so I wanna make sure that you guys know that. Um, these are uh, a few ways to get connected. So there's um, multiple small groups. So we've got the Ageless Inspiration. Um, we've got the Ladies Bible Study, which has concluded. However, there is um, the, their end of the year potluck, which is open to anyone, so um, mainly ladies. Uh, but, you know, but anyway. Um, so if you want to do, <laughs> Danielle. <laughs> so if you are interested in that, it's gonna be at Miss Becky's house. And if, um, if you are interested in getting connected with the ladies, uh, Danielle is here, her number is up there as well. Um, and then after you know, all of the holidays that we get to, get to celebrate, we'll restart um, the ladies Bible study after that. Uh, the park small group, which makes it, meets every Wednesday. And then we have a new one to add up here, which I was excited about, the Young Families Small Group. So uh, if you're a, a, a family with younger children, um, call or text Adrienne and uh, her husband, Steve. They're here. They meet Tuesdays at 6. Um, keep it moving. All right. So there's a few cool things coming up for uh, the holidays. So uh, we are in two, uh, two Saturdays. There's the Christmas parade. Pastor Eric wanted to... Yeah, all right, cool. You got my mic back on? Okay, so here's what we're doing for the Christmas parade. We have an, we have an idea. Okay, so we're good. We oh, don't... No, I still have more, but go ahead. Okay, no, I know, but so... Okay, go ahead. Sorry. You know, so I'm what we're going to do, uh, we have the trailer, we have the plan. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be organizing and leading it, okay? So none of you have to be scared that I'm going to put you out in front of everybody. So we're going to be putting that float together. We're going to do it on Saturday morning. Okay, before, uh, yeah, I know. But it's, it's a very simple idea. We'll show you a picture of it in the coming weeks. Uh, we're going to basically build a float that looks like a bunch of Christmas presents and talk about how Jesus is the greatest gift to oh, our world. Sure. Okay? So yeah. it's going to be really simple. And guess what? I know exactly where we can get a ton of huge boxes. Because they're all in my, in my house right now. Uh, so we're going to be doing that. Uh, if you want to be involved in that in any way, you, you, if you just want to walk alongside the float and hand out stuff to people, if you want to stand on the float and do your wave, my daughter is convinced uh, that the float is for her. <laughs> she'll find out otherwise, but I'm sure she'll be dressed as Elsa that morning. Uh, but come on out. Uh, we'll send out some more information about that in email. It or does text. come right in front of our church. Yeah, that's it the does. Cool thing. That's so, the route. Uh, the out route ends in front of our church. We're be so okay. we'll be so that's all. That's my piece. <laughs> <laughs> all right, the next one made it awkward all right uh christmas eve we will have two services which is really exciting um uh 3 30 and 5 it's a saturday so we're gonna have two services um mainly because look at how packed this room is and this is just like normal right so we're gonna need we're gonna need more room which is a blessing for all of our families that are gonna attend with us so two services uh 3 30 and 5 and then christmas day we will have a service because christmas falls on a sunday this year so uh, but I know there's going to be more details with that, but I just wanted to put that out there for all of y'all that are planning. A couple more slides. Check it out. Operation Christmas Child. We talked about this last week, and uh, last Sunday we gave $336, and I know the goal is about $10 per box, and so we were able, uh, we were aiming to do 50 boxes, and we did just over 50. We did about 54 that I counted. So, yeah. So just a couple pictures for you. This is all the kids and the adults putting them together. You can finish that. There we go. That's Briggs. All right. That's it. I think that's it. Okay, cool. All right. You want to close this out? We can do like a thing. Like just like a... Oh, yes. Oh, we got one more thing. Okay. Um, no, no, no. No, no, no. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Yes. Come up. Miss Carrie. Jess. 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 Come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on up here. Come on up. Come on up. So in honor of your first, yeah, in honor of your first week with us, and just as a welcome, we had a beautiful cake made. Yeah. Just don't drop it. <laughs> We're going to sing happy birthday. It says happy birthday. <laughs> so we're going to sing happy birthday. You, oh, she, you hear that? She said, 
don't make a big deal of it. So we're going to make a big deal of it. <laughs> and his, his name is Rev. I don't know if you guys know that either, but it's Rev. Are you ready? Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to Now we're done. Now okay, we're bless done. Bless the food. Okay. You're dismissed. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.